All right, we're underway. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Christopher Malaro. I am the CEO and co-founder of NeuroFlow. I'm joined here today with Adam Partis, our Chief Operating Officer, and two very special guests, Dr. Medallia and Dr. Gehrman. Um, before I turn it over to them to introduce themselves, I, I just want to set expectations. This is not a NeuroFlow presentation uh, about our technology. This is not meant to be a sales pitch. This is not meant to be a demo. Um, if you came here for that, I'm sorry. I hope you learned something. We'd love to talk to you and engage with you offline if you have some interest utilizing our technology in your practice. That being said, in the last two years since starting this company, we've learned a lot about the digital health and technology space for mental health and getting professionals and experts together like Dr. Medallia and Dr. Gehrman, we thought it would behoove us and our industry, our colleagues and, felt, and the clinicians out there to share some lessons learned and industry trends that we've observed over the last two years. So with that, um, I'll open it up to, I'll pass it over to Adam and our two guests. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to uh, post them in the question comments below. We'll get to them at a convenient time in the presentation. If we don't get to them to the end, we have 15 minutes set aside at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Thank you very much. And without further ado, Adam Partis. Great. Uh, so here we're going to go a little more casual from here on out with first name. So John, if you want to start by introducing yourself a little bit about your, your background. Sure. Uh, so I'm John Medallia. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Drexel University and an adjunct assistant professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I began at Drexel in the, this past fall, and I predominantly research uses of active brain stimulation and network analysis to enhance or repair cognitive functions. Great, and Phil, if you would uh, introduce yourself as well. Uh, sure, my name is Phil Gehrman. I'm a clinical psychologist and a assistant professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. Uh, my specialization is in non pharmacological treatment of insomnia and sleep disorders. And a lot of the work that I do is uh, with my telehealth throughout the uh, VA system. Great. So and we're going to hit on all the topics listed here throughout this presentation. Uh, so we're excited to really cover a lot of ground. So to get started, like any good presentation, we do have a disclosure slide. Um, so both John and Phil have not been compensated in any way by Neuroflow. They're not advisors to Neuroflow in no way involved with the company. Uh, and likewise, any ideas or opinions expressed by them um, you know, are, are of their own and not uh, on behalf of any organizations that, that they might be a part of. And lastly, we do mention a lot of different uh, companies, organizations throughout this presentation. Uh, those aren't personal or professional endorsements. Um, so again, meant to be purely educational. So with that, we'll jump right into it. Uh, there was an Accenture report released earlier this week, actually, that, that was very timely for this webinar. Uh, a lot of data about how people are using technology more and more in health and in mental health. Uh, and I think what was really surprising, we'll show a few graphs from that report throughout the webinar, uh, is really still how much growth is happening in just the last couple of years. Uh, so I don't think anyone would be surprised if we said, you know, people are using more technology than they were five or 10 years ago. Uh, but these, these graphs you see here are from 2016 to 2018. So in just the last two years, the use of a lot of different types of technology, uh, in some cases have basically doubled. Uh, when you look at something like smart scales, We'll talk a lot about wearables. Uh, certainly EHRs are becoming more and more used by patients and not just by healthcare systems. Um, so it's really impressive just how much this is still growing uh, in, in a digital age. And when you look at specifically mobile applications, tablet applications, uh, we see digital health. Um, and we'll talk through a number of these throughout. Uh, but it's, it's certainly impressive when you look at the, the hard and fast numbers that it's still growing at, at such a rapid rate uh, when you figure a lot of people have already had uh, smartphones for you know, a while now. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll pause there before we jump into some more of the specific topics. Um, see, John or Phil, you know, either in your professional or your research or your personal use, you know, is this a trend that uh, goes in line with what you've seen? Are there specific um, you know, applications that 
um, you've been hearing more and more about. So certainly the patient population as a, uh, in the sleep clinic, uh, it seems like with each, every few months, I'm seeing an increased rate of patients coming in uh, showing me data that they've been tracking on their sleep, whether it's on an app or, or with uh, some wearables. So, uh, so more and more, they are coming in. Already using apps or asking how their apps can be integrated into the treatment that they're receiving. So I have a follow-up So certainly uh, a colleague of mine at the VA has done some of the work with providing patients feedback on their CPAP use through these, this remote monitoring of their devices and did find that it, uh, receiving that feedback on use increased rate of adherence. It wasn't a dramatic increase, but it does seem like receiving that personalized feedback does lead to increased rates. Uh, as far as mental health is concerned, the VA and others have developed quite a few mental health oriented apps uh, it, it, in terms of actual data on how they impact treatment outcomes. Uh, I think there's less of that available at this point. Many of them are still fairly untested. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. In terms of the time involved, because there's sort of a cash 22 that, yes, more data is certainly great, um, but then it also then needs to be reviewed by the clinician. If they're not directly connected to that application in some way, they might not be able to do that until the next time the patient comes in, you would say, or they're actually coming in and showing you the data to see how perfect that's um, you know, Have you guys seen that, that balance between having more data available to review it? I think that's really the challenge because there's this assumption that more data is is better, but clinicians are all. Move on to more health. So there are a number of you know popular telehealth options specifically for mental health. Um, Aware now. One that I think that's familiar to a lot of the folks on the, the webinar. Uh, you know, I know, Phil, you do quite a bit of telehealth work within the VA system, and I think you have lots of direct tools to help us with sort of from VA to VA. So, can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's really interesting for people. Yeah, so for my area of specialization of uh, cognitive therapy or insomnia, uh, many of these facilities do not have a provider. Sufficient provider training in the treatment to be able to a high demand facility. So there's about a, a 40% rate of insomnia in, in veteran populations. And so what we do is group treatment where the veterans are sitting in a room at another facility somewhere around the country. And we do a two groups of about six to eight veterans at a time. So it's a great opportunity to increase access, access to uh, evidence based therapy. While minimizing travel for needs for for veterans, I just want.
want to pause there for one second before we continue with the presentation, make sure that our sound check is okay. We're having a lot of questions come through. Uh, that says sound is very poor. We're in and out uh, as a group. So uh, quick troubleshooting things so that we can move on from here with, with positive sound. Um, so if you're able to, um, we could do a sound check. <laughs> if there's an improvement, uh, please note that. Okay, thank you, Luke. Luke says he could hear me okay. If the rest of us could speak up, um, he's saying that we can't hear us. So uh, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Betty. We'll uh, continue to um, to speak loudly and clearly for this presentation. Ah, Blanca, you could finally hear, I'm glad. All right, Alicia could hear. All right, we're, it sounds like we're back on board. Um, for the, if you missed the earlier part of the presentation, we will be sending out a recorded version of this and these slides as well. So uh, rest assured that any data that you may have missed, uh, you'll get to uh, you'll get you'll get that data and you'll get the presentation uh, right after this webinar. So uh, we'll continue as planned. Thank you. Great. So thanks to Chris, who's our CEO and IT support around here. So uh, along the lines of telehealth and what. Bill was just discussing, um, people do often think about telehealth as enabling remote monitoring for people in rural areas or where there's um, transportation issues. But I think uh, we also see a lot of interest in just general telehealth for uh, people that need ease of access. Um, so with that in mind, John, you know, what do you think about this telehealth, not just as a way to reach people that maybe are too far from a provider that live in a rural area, uh, but people that just want either on-demand access or um, sort of ongoing uh, telehealth applications through some of these um, examples shown here. Yeah, I think there's, I guess just what comes to mind first is sort of the, the flip sides of the coin. On the one hand, I think that uh, having patients be able to readily access things increases all sorts of burdens to the individual. Um, it might even decrease burdens to the care systems in terms of transportation and, and slotted uh, times at the facilities. Um, and I think that one of the new uh, trade-offs that we're going to start observing is there's many issues within different clinical contexts and syndromes of dependence between the individuals being treated and the providers. And so I think that um, one of the new trends that we're going to see is some evaluation around uh, on the one hand, we have access, which is facilitating a lot of excellent growth among individuals that really need it. But then we're going to have increasingly clinician researchers looking at um, how are we going to keep people uh, moving up the hill to well-being without becoming dependent on that system indefinitely. Manage their health in the moment where it's shorter, you know, over the course of a couple minutes rather than, you know, longer sessions. Do you see any decrease in quality as a potential? Uh, it can go both ways. So, for example, there's with some of the, especially some of the remote monitoring studies showing that if you can catch people at the beginnings of a crisis, whether it's a mental health or physical health crisis, you can frequently intervene before it becomes a full-blown uh, problem that requires an emergency room visit. So I think there's an extent to which having more uh, to a provider can help to uh, inter with early intervention. On the other hand, you could certainly see how there becomes an expectation of, well, the moment I don't feel well, I'm immediately calling my provider. And uh, as John was saying, really increasing the burden on providers. So I think that it's a tricky balance to strike. Yeah, I think that's that's good insight and it's clear that the landscape is going to continue to involve or evolve there, um, both for patients and providers in terms of setting expectations as now technology enables us to be more in touch with each other 
um, throughout the day and not just on these predefined um, you know, clinical sessions. Uh, so I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on to the next topic, um, which is talking about wearables um, and biometric data. So I think this is one of the most astounding ones over the last four years in terms of the growth that um, we've seen in terms of adoption of these devices where, you know, I think some people probably figured it would have slowed down or was stagnant. Uh, but surprisingly, perhaps it's actually increased tremendously over the last few years. And we'll talk more about different kinds of wearables. Um, but John or Phil, is this something that you see patients or in your research studies, um, something of increasing value as consumers are adopting it? Do you actually see clinical value to it as well? Uh, I see a lot of clinical potential. Uh, the, the, the difficulty I'm having right now is the lack of data on the accuracy and validity of the wearables. So I very frequently have patients come in and they'll say, well, I thought I slept, slept well last night, but my wearable tells me I didn't. So therefore I must not have slept well. And so people treat these devices as, as absolute truth sometimes. And uh, and I'm often asked how much I trust the data, and I, I, it's difficult for me to evaluate because validation studies are, are rarely done, and if they are done, they're not published. So I think once we have more evidence on the accuracy of these devices, uh, they'll have a much greater role in, uh, in clinical practice. How about in terms of recent um, what do you see? Yeah, and I think kind of piggybacking on what Philip was saying, and we, we have more of an outpatient um, sort of undergraduate environment within our in-house clinic. And so it's very normative for the undergraduates to be using things like Fitbits and, and paying fairly close attention to it and sort of achieving their milestones with uh, kind of virtual rewards for getting the certain performance levels. But I think that that's still kind of the pervasive issue for me is being somebody that's really invested and curious about the growth of technology and its relationship to psychology in general. Uh, it's it's the same sort of thing, the kind of inferences that people make based on what appears to be a very credible piece of technology when often the benchmarking is falling far behind. So I think that um, increasingly you see sort of the blurring between enterprise and academic research in these areas. And I'm, I'm hopeful and, and frankly pretty optimistic that we're gonna find a way for everybody to be fairly transparent about some of the signal processing that's going on. Uh, that's gonna be a little bit more accessible to the researchers over time. And then as the researcher clinicians get a little bit more savvy over time about how to communicate with the patients, uh, hopefully the, the patients will be internalizing the way to treat the technology in their own lives. So you could imagine a day where this kind of loop closes and people are working well as kind of a distributed team. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm a little nervous about a lot of these things kind of penetrating the market and then uh, kind of overriding some of the clinical intuitions that people have spent years researching. Yeah, so I think part of what's getting implied here, and we'll talk more um, towards the end of the presentation about the regulatory environment, um, is really about context and claims. Uh, and I think a lot of what we've seen is, you know, wearable devices that are primarily direct to consumer um, maybe lack some of that context because it's right in the consumer's hands and they don't necessarily know how to interpret it uh, in addition, or I guess in the context and the perspective of their overall well-being. Uh, whereas, you know, a tool that uh, is used in the context of, for example, in mental health, using the context of therapy, uh, the provider can provide some of that insight into how they should be interpreting the data, um, why they might see different results from uh, Sleep app being super clear on what the claims are that these different devices or technologies make. You know, not all devices are created equal. This right. In so, in summary, just be careful with what devices you have patients use, and make sure they understand the context of how the data from those should be interpreted. But certainly, a lot of uh, potential for how these can impact both research and clinical care. So we're gonna move on to insurance reimbursement because uh, this is certainly a, a hot topic when it comes to digital health and mental health, uh, especially recently. So just at the end of 2017, CMS uh, reported a couple big changes that, that started in January now of 2018 uh, related to remote monitoring and telehealth, 
uh, as well as behavioral health integration. Uh, and Chris, you gave a really good summary earlier of what the different codes were that uh, were announced. So I'd love to have you share that with everyone today. Yeah, there's uh, so there's two exciting codes that are uh, that have been announced from CMS just this past January. Uh, there's one related to behavioral health integration uh, and another related to physiological remote monitoring. So behavioral health integration is billable by any non-psychologist provider, so primary care providers. Um, they have opened up to psychiatrists and uh, NPs, PAs, uh, as well as uh, pain doctors. So the, the idea is to keep the primary care providers integrated in their um, in their behavioral health if there's a comorbid issue. Um, and we could go into more detail about that. But then there's the remote monitoring code, which uses physiological data uh, that is required to have patient-generated health data uh, that's reviewed by a, uh, by a provider. It could be remotely uh, in order to guide treatment, inform treatment, and assess progress over time in between clinical visits. So both those codes are are roughly $62 per month per patient. Uh, They both can be done remotely and require about 20 minutes of the clinician's uh, time. Um, So there's a a number of different ways that you would have to uh, be compliant with the CMS guidelines and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions offline about that. Yeah, and in case you're curious and want to do some more research, um, the two codes that we're specifically referencing for BHI it is 99484. And then for remote physiological monitoring, it's 99091. Um, there were also some updates made to telehealth reporting, um, such as removing the GT qualifier or modifier, uh, which just reduces the administrative burden, makes it easier for providers to bill for telehealth. Uh, and we already see some of the private payers following CMS's lead, and I'm sure that will continue going into the future. So the next topic that we wanted to touch on is a a really important one, uh, and that's about patient engagement. Uh, So NAMI this past year released a a really nice thorough report on making patient engagement the the new standard for mental health care um, and really having a culture shift towards that. Uh, And they reported that, you know, 70 percent of patients who drop out of mental health treatment will do so after just one or two sessions. Uh, so clearly there's something going on in those first couple sessions where we want to be able to make a bigger impact so that people stick with therapy uh, and get the outcomes that they need. Uh, but when it comes to engagement, I think that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so Phil and John, curious to hear uh, your thoughts on patient engagement. What does that mean in, in your practice or your research? Well, I guess I'll, I'll actually start with a question for Philip because when I was uh, finishing a lot of my clinical rotations, you know, this was a well-known phenomenon of early dropout, and uh, I'm relatively well-versed on certain research about the relationship between the uh, patient and the practitioner and the different sort of features of that matching that help drive good success within that treatment. Um, But I I know relatively little about what even accounts for what we understand about that huge dropout rate. So I don't I don't know if either in the context of of VA practice or otherwise, if Philip, you could say a little bit about that. So interestingly, there is a body of research uh, looking at this phenomenon and in which they've contacted people who drop out after one session of treatment. And actually, one of the most common reasons for dropout is because people are feeling better that they went, the fact that they initiated treatment was an indication that they were actually ready to start taking some steps and uh, maybe didn't necessarily need to see a mental health provider. So on the positive, some of this dropout is, is incur, occurring because people are doing better. But for the remainder of the people, which is still the overwhelming majority, they still really would benefit from additional clinical services, but yet are not uh, are not getting them for a variety of reasons. And certainly uh, travel, you know, inconvenience, cost, you know, there, there's a lot of factors that feed into this. So to the extent that technology can help to decrease some of these barriers, um, they should be able to have at least some positive impact on patient engagement. Uh, but I, again, I'll be curious to see what the research begins to show in this area. Yeah, we provide some examples of where we've seen uh, 
the industry go in, term, in terms of trying to improve patient engagement, um, you know, one that's certainly important to us here at Neuroflow and, and I think well beyond is real-time feedback. Uh, you know, with mental health, it's much tougher to put a number on something so you can see that progress as opposed to if you were monitoring, you know, insulin levels or cholesterol levels or weight gain. Uh, it's, it's much easier to track that and see some incremental progress. With mental health, sometimes you have to be invested for a, a good while before you feel a difference. Um, so anything that can provide real-time feedback is something that you know we, we think can help engagement a lot. Uh, and just more frequent interaction. Um, you know, If someone's even going for a weekly session, it's one hour a week with a clinician, that can be great. But if they are not able to generalize that into their, their overall life, then it, it loses a lot of its impact. Um, so that's why we, we show some apps here that are also good tools for self-management, um, things like Headspace and Calm and eMindful, uh, as well as the VA apps that just have people thinking about their mental health more than that once a week and, and taking steps to improve their wellness, the same as you know, you'd encourage someone to go to the gym uh, to you know, increase their physical wellness. Um, in terms of homework compliance, I'm, I'm curious if, if you two have thoughts there. You know, there's certainly been meta-analyses done looking at correlation between uh, homework adherence and overall clinical outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, but as we well know, patients often don't put in the, the time at home for a variety of reasons. Um, so if we could speak a little on homework compliance and where you see opportunities or challenges there. So certainly uh, one of the apps that I integrate pretty routinely into uh, my clinical practice is the CBTI coach um, developed by the VA. And one of the real nice, some of the nice features about it are that you can um, have different alarms or reminders go off to prompt patients to engage in uh, different strategies that you've discussed in sessions. So uh, just anecdotally, I've certainly seen the ability of these apps to be able to uh, serve as reminders for, for people um, be, to uh, make it more likely that they're going to be able to follow their homework through. Yeah, we mentioned incentive programs here as well. That can, I think, be interpreted in a few different ways. It can be as simple as, uh, you know, an app like Headspace that shows streaks for users as they um, continue to interact day after day. And, um, you know, sort of the psychology behind that, that that improves, uh, you know, stickiness as well as even more clear financial incentive programs um, through behavioral economic techniques uh, like loss aversion where, you know, you say, all right, well, you're going to get a, $20 gift card if you complete, you know, these three activities and then for each one you don't complete, um, you get docked something from that. I think that there's, there's been quite a bit of research also here at Penn that's shown that to be really effective, not just for mental health, but overall protocol adherence. Uh, before we move on, John, is there anything that you wanted to add related to patient engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just always mindful of the, the research <coughs> end is that as people get more and more control through these wearable, wearable devices and people's smartphones and as technology keeps getting miniaturized, I, I, I really like that Philip frames it specifically through memory because I think uh, within a lot of the syndromes that people are working with, memory is somehow directly or indirectly affected and the attention of the patient is anywhere but the things that are going to actually be making them better, which is part of the syndrome itself. And so um, there's kind of a, also a broad context of just kind of enlightenment for both the patients and the providers about the sort of ecological day-to-day -day life of the patients. And the closer these memory cues get to cueing the right persons at the right time, you would imagine that this is not only good for the patient, but can help us be even more efficient about the way we use technology. Because again, there's a trade-off about about oversaturating persons, even if the technology is very available. So we want to find those efficient sort of natural fits to individuals for the treatments. Yeah, it's definitely an important balance to consider. And I think the quicker that we can get people uh, self-managing, I think that's, that's better for everyone involved. Uh, so we'll go through the last few slides fairly quickly, but I think they're important to touch upon um, in this overall theme of technology and, and mental health. Uh, when it comes to this data that's being generated, uh, you know, are consumers even willing to share that, or is that something they just use for themselves? And I think the data shows pretty convincingly uh, that they are willing to share that, uh, especially with their doctor. Overwhelming percentage there, ninety percent, that's stayed high. Which you know, presumably you could imply from that that they see the value in it, or they would have stopped doing it. 
Um, similarly, they're willing to do it with their health insurance plans. Um, you know, a lot of times that means reduced premiums if they can show some uh, some level of improvement. Uh, certainly, friends and family. Uh, so it's it's good to see that this is something that people don't just want to collect, but they actually want to share to uh, to leverage. Uh, one thing that I don't think we could have this webinar without talking about is is HIPAA compliance and patient data security and privacy. Uh, so, yes, consumers are willing to share their data, but really who else has access to that? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's really important that, especially as providers, if you're going to be interacting with these applications and getting patient data, that you s- select vendors that uh, have you know business associates agreements set up that define how they're using the data, who has access to it, um, how it's being secured, and you know, on that note, making sure that any data being collected is encrypted both in transit and at rest, and that there's some reasonable level of identity authentication. And you know, what we mean by that is, you know, I'll give an example from what we do. If a provider adds a patient to uh, Neuroflow's platform because they want them to be able to see their own data or record sessions, uh, the, they use their patient's uh, date of birth, and then the patient would get an email. They'd have to confirm their email uh, as well as enter their date of birth before that account is created. So it's not as simple as, you know, if a provider mistypes an email, suddenly uh, some random person out there has access to data that they otherwise shouldn't. Um, so these are just, I mean, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, but a few things that people can keep in mind um, to make sure they're, they're dealing with reputable vendors. Um, Phil or John, anything that you wanted to touch on here related to uh, EPHI or, or patient privacy? I would just say, if, if anything, not only, my experience is that not only are patients willing to share a lot of their data, they're, they're often willing to overshare data. It kind of relates to what we were discussing earlier in terms of just providers not necessarily knowing what to do with the volume of data. Uh, that they're receiving. So, uh, um, and if anything, I often find that when I have conversations with patients about privacy and in, in, in HIPAA, uh, I, I'm I'm somewhat concerned oftentimes that they're not taking it seriously enough. So, so I actually think a lot of consumers are not appreciating the importance of keeping some of their health data uh, secure, and I think they're assuming a level of security that's not always there. And I'm sort of, I'm a little bit fixated on the final column in the last chart where there's this spike from um, the reported 0% sharing with government departments and agencies creeping up close to half of persons reporting that they're doing it. So, I mean, one natural question is which agencies? And then the second thing, I think, sort of surrounding HIPAA issues or what are the intentions of the patient when they're bringing these different pieces of information uh, to different agencies or persons? So. Um, presumably a lot of them are bringing it into the clinical environment to help be sort of an ally and an advocate for themselves with the provider but then as Philip's saying it's kind of drinking from a fire hose if there's just more and more metrics all of the time and then I think that there's often the goodwill of many people as a lot of these technologies become just more normal in the population to sort of be sharing it with hopefully uh, benevolent intentions of researchers and other agencies that want to fund work to understand how to use these techniques Um, but I do think that uh, in the same way that hopefully these companies are actually protecting the data of the patients that there should be again kind of a a culture shift around just what does it mean to share this and uh, the conversation should be what are you expecting to get back for that Um, because it's it it requires effort to share it in some contexts and in other contexts where the data data could just be otherwise available um, we need to think carefully about the agency of the patient in that transaction so I think that this um, a lot of our standard intuitions for how this should work um, are generally good, but then how that maps onto the complexity of some of these things is going to be a, a challenge for us. Yeah, it's a, a lot of good points brought up, um, and I think in terms of government, it's sort of, sort of a natural transition to the next thing that we want to talk about, which is the FDA and you know, how are they treating uh, all these different apps and technologies that are coming out, and really it's, it's all about the claims that the companies make. Um, so for something like a Fitbit, where they're just claiming to be a sort of a wellness device, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of regulation. 
if you have an app that's you know clearly marked this is not meant to intend or this is not intended to replace the clinician this is not a therapy um, again the fda is is much more lenient there uh, but then when you get into now this is a digital therapeutic and pair uh, is shown here as the first fda cleared digital therapeutic they are going to have to go through um, you know your standard 510k or, or pma uh, applications in order to be approved and, and sold so it's it's interesting to see that the FDA is, I think, getting really smart about how they treat mobile medical applications, and just last year did release a lot more guidance there, uh, and, and making it clear that if you know the claims are more based around wellness and not uh, being a treatment or a therapeutic, uh, that they see the value in them, um, and they they find them to be low enough risk that more often than not, uh, they're not going to uh, exercise a lot of uh, enforcement. So the last thing that we wanted to, to touch upon is, you know, how does all of this data interact with your electronic medical records, your practice management systems? Um, certainly, if you work in private practice, this might not be as big of a concern, but for people in larger healthcare systems, I think we know well that if it doesn't land in the EMR, it didn't happen. Uh, so I would say the EMRs and, and these practice management systems are a bit behind probably where a lot of what we've talked about today in terms of accepting new technology uh, just mainly because it's it's very challenging and for the companies that want to integrate their data into these systems it can be quite uh, cost prohibitive um, what's interesting though is uh, I think it's also going the other way um, and we saw that at um, the hymns conference in Las Vegas uh, a couple weeks ago where Apple showed off a, a new uh, feature that they've built to directly integrate with very large uh, EMRs like Epic and Cerner um, really in the matter of seconds uh, from someone's phone. So now they can have uh, all of their uh, patient data right on their mobile device. They can have it from multiple healthcare systems. Um, so really quite impressive from a, a technical feat. Um, and I'm curious to hear, John and Phil, your thoughts from a uh, maybe not an ethical perspective, but um, just in general, what does it now mean for consumers to be able to, you know, have a few clicks and now have all of their uh, detailed medical records available to them on their smartphones. Um, I think it's it's always an issue of what are they going to do with all that information. I mean, a, a fine balance we're often trying to strike is giving people access to their, their medical information because it's their personal information. But at the same time, they, they don't necessarily have the knowledge and skills to know how to interpret that data appropriately. So it can lead to a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of misunderstanding uh, for patients. So I think the challenge is how do you uh, respect the fact that it's, it is someone's personal data and they have a degree of ownership over it, but giving it to them in a way that they can make sense of it. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, um, you know, to the extent that I, I, I see um, trends within people being more and more interested in their own health and, and trying to be healthier, it really comes down to the interpretation, again, the intentions once they have the information. And so I think that, um, you know, overhead is only increasing on a lot of practicing care providers. Uh, everything needs to be sort of collated and documented and increasingly um, as the different companies start to sort of try to find ways to provide technologies for more efficient charting and the market pressure changes that, you can imagine that there's a kind of efficient two-way communication between what the physician or other practitioner might be seeing and what the patient is seeing. And so the problem is that as that sort of accelerates, presumably, the more and more these markets are, are growing, uh, the communication is often going to lag somewhat behind just because we don't know what we're going to see until we get there. And so I do think it's it's probably helpful that everyone just starts, starts to kind of assume that this is going to become more transparent, accessible, and faster. And then it's time now to take some of the slower conversations about what that might mean once it starts in, entering different clinical environments. Yeah, I'd agree. I think in, in some ways the technology might even be moving ahead of those conversations. So it's, it's important to be having them now so we don't fall uh, maybe further behind. Uh, so just wrapping up here, I think this is a, a nice summary of a lot of what we've talked about today is, 
you know, not only is this shift happening where there's more and more technology, it's easier to access, um, you know, patients are sharing it, uh, starting to make its way into EMRs. Uh, you know, we want to see how are patients actually perceiving um, the value of these. And I, th I think across the board, um, again, from that Accenture report, it, it's shown that patients do see a benefit in this. So uh, the fact that people are using this technology more, that they see a benefit in it, uh, means we have to be continuing to have these conversations and understanding how to best leverage technology for assessment, for tracking, um, for self-management, because it's something that people are doing and they see value in. Um, so it doesn't seem like it's going to slow down anytime.